Okay, good morning. Let me put this down. Today I'm a peacock. So the brain isn't functioning. It's day four. We're operating on far too little sleep, far too much energetic love and connection, frying our nervous systems in profound ways, certainly myself. So I feel like I've got nothing in material this morning, nothing at all. Just a mushy brain. I can offer you mush. Who would like some gruel? It's right here. You wake up in the morning and it's just not working. You know that feeling? Like, it feels as though there's a boulder right now in my brain and everything is sort of skirting around that thing, right? Okay, today is going to be a massive day. Massive day, like really, really massive. Um, amazing speakers yesterday, amazing speakers the day before. The big surprise for me yesterday was Bala and Alex. Holy crap! I've been watching those two guys speak at these conferences now for the last five or six years. And I have never seen what happened yesterday. I mean, they're always good, but yesterday they brought their best. That was big. I've never been kicked out of a room to keep Bala on stage before. Wow. This morning, uh, how many of you have met or seen Gail's work before? Okay. I think it was 2008, Gail, when we met the first time. Is that right? Gail and I first met in 2005. Wow, really? And Adam taught me in 15 minutes more than I'd learned in a week. <laughs> but this one is me that gets to offer the hype uh, because That's all the things only considered. Thing nice I'll say about you. Thank you. Because all things considered, you've earned it for the work that you've done and the dedication you've had to our community. It's been profound. <clears throat> I first met Gail in 2005, and I guess this story for me is the one that's always stuck in my head and the one that I'd like to share with you in relation to her work. Um, and amazing Gail's work where it started heavily in sharing her autism protocol and uh, all the amazing information uh, that Gail has in relation to uh, working with that particular uh, type of stress and supporting development from, uh, from that place. One of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen in my entire career was that I believe in 2005 I was at Gail's clinic. Oh, that was eight. Okay, see? Shit. I don't, it's not working, but at least yours is. Gail told me yesterday, I asked her, um, you're on in the morning. Are you a morning person? She said, yeah, I'm up at 6.30. I said, thank God. Okay. In 2008, I went into Gail's clinic and I met a boy named Neil. Neil, right? I met a boy named Neil, and he was... Um, I do not know the correct vernacular to not necessarily, as it applies to autism, be in what would be politically correct and or the current vernacular. However, what I would say is, depending on whether or not this is still used, I don't want to be insulting. And I bring this up because Gail's in the thick of this all the time. And she corrects my vernacular all the time in relation to autism because it's so misunderstood by so many of us. But I met Neil, and Neil was... How, how would you describe Neil on the spectrum, Gail, if you, that's even something you're comfortable with? See, I knew it would be something she wasn't comfortable with using. Okay, so Neil's diagnosis was autism, but a lot of people that looked at him would have said Asperger's, which now I guess by the DSM, which is a big book of bullshit, is, it, yeah, um, it, Asperger's is now gone, and it's just part of the autism spectrum. But when I first met Neil, um, he stimmed a lot. Do you know what stimming is? Stimming in autism is if you've watched them and they shake. They sort of look like Orthodox Jews praying at the Wailing Wall. Maybe that's where they are mentally. Who knows? But Neil was uh, stimming a lot, and I don't want to say dysfunctional, 
but certainly not at the time high level functioning, if that's a fair, fair statement. Okay. Again, I tiptoe around the vernacular. What was most extraordinary, he, he was amazing to meet, and I, I probably, in, in truth, because I haven't had a lot, of, uh, a lot of experience working with autism, short of learning my first time, you never put an autistic kid in the harness the first time you meet him, because that's all going to go bad. Um, yeah, binding an autistic child, especially if they're high, um, high on the spectrum and stimming a lot and sort of involuntary in reference to uh, some of their physical action, profound. But four years later, Gail and I uh, met again, and I was teaching a class that uh, Gail attended in Edmonton. It was Edmonton, right? That weird corner room. Yeah. Yeah, I was in Edmonton, and Gail came to class with Neil, who was now, four years later, not stimming. There was no stim. He was articulate. And in two seconds, Gail asked, can he attend with me? And, you know, I, I dismissed it in truth. I dismissed it. I thought, I, I don't know why you'd want an autistic child to attend my class. But sure. You know, it's, it, it doesn't hurt me at all to have Neil attend. And I, I certainly dismissed him, and I dismissed, I, I pre-qualified. And Neil, I didn't realize, wasn't just attending as a tag-along like we need a babysitter. Neil was attending behind the computer, running the software. After four years of Gail's work, Neil was now a practitioner working on other children with autism in Gail's clinic behind the device. Like, I just got shivers. I don't know about you, but like my whole body just went into shivers thinking about it. And you know what was cooler than that? Amidst my pre-qualification, what was most extraordinary was Neil started asking questions about approach and about usage as it applied to the device that blew me away. He was conceptualizing how he approached working with someone else in such a profound and different way than that which I had thought. I remember my, my jaw was just floored, was just floored. For me, it is that story which absolutely exemplifies who this, or, or not even exemplifies, because in truth, I, I've never had that much personal time with Gail other than professionally working together over the years, so I, I certainly don't want to reduce to that. But for me, that was an epic experience, a massive development in my understanding of what this field is. So again, I will remind you, we do not work on disease. Our device does not cure disease. In fact, nothing does cure disease. The only thing that cures disease is the body itself. Our device can support the body in doing what the body is naturally designed to do, which is to heal itself. We do not treat, de, uh, treat mitigate, or um, any of the other vernacular that we're not supposed to use, disease. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a true quantum master and someone, in my opinion, that is on the front lines of change in change of perception as to what the mission is of these kids and Gail's work at this point is not just autism, which has been an amazing evolution to watch over the last six years. Um, this woman is a wealth of knowledge. This woman is the real deal. And watching Neil, an autistic child four years later, navigate the software and use it on other autistic children, I think is the most beautiful story I've ever heard in quantum biofeedback. So a huge round of applause for Gail. And have a good one. Hey, do you need a mic? Me? Yes. The one that's uh, in my hand? No, I have not. Oh, I know. No, I don't think so. Mic? Oh, if, well, I don't think we're going to have any time for questions. I'm sorry. You'll have to come and ask them later because I've <laughs> got so much to say and we're going to say as much as we can. Oh, shit. Wait, I forgot one thing. I'm sorry. You can't. <laughs> you had your time. No. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the lady and lord of the manor. <laughs> My husband really recently became a laird of Scotland. <laughs> we, we own a piece of a castle. <laughs> Yep. Anyway, my name is Gail Gillingham. I do have a husband named Wiley, and I do use that name occasionally, but I also have kept my first marriage name, mainly because I have four wonderful sons who carry that name, and five wonderful grandsons. And so I have not let it go. I'm a family therapist. I live in St. Albert, Alberta, which is a small town on the north west corner of Edmonton. We actually touch Edmonton, so it's also considered the best city in Canada to live in. So we've got a good choice there. I'm going to be sharing my new book, a tool that I developed when I was uh, over the years, first for myself, then for my family therapy clinic, and after 911, realized it's a book this world needs. Every person in this world needs. So I'm going to be sharing that tool with you, and then I'm going to be turning on the skill and showing you how I use the tool in the midst of a session. I'm going to try and get as much as possible out here, but I will admit uh, my biggest anxiety is I have far too much to say in far too little time. Okay, so we're going to start with this uh, slide. Yet deep within, your core continues shining brightly, unbreakable, unbending. In 1993, I was a house parent in the Northwest Territories and had 24 teenagers in my care with my first husband. I was writing my first book on autism and I had actually taken that job because it allowed me the daytime to write and the mornings and the evenings to look after these teenagers. In the midst of it, I was living in a marriage of 24 years that had been abusive right from the start. I grew up in a very happy, healthy, safe home. My grandparents were so strict, they did not even grow marling, malting barley because they didn't want to make pain for anyone else. And malting barley was the best crop you could grow in our area to make money. But they would not do it. That's the kind of family I was in. My father did not take an alcoholic drink until he was 65, and it was a glass of wine. So I grew up safe. I grew up loved. I grew up with honesty. And I met this man who had experienced the exact opposite all his life, and who used, and his whole family used, lie as their way of coping with the world. Everything he said was a lie. Everything he says today is a lie. He would go into periodic rages and beat me. And I never knew why. But I conformed to his behavior to keep him safe, to keep me safe. I believe mothers and fathers should stay together for their children. We had four sons, and I chose to stay with him for my sons. 20 years after we were married, his secret came out on national television. He spent a number of years in an orphanage in Newfoundland as a teenager, where he was sexually abused by the Christian brothers, or the so-called Christian brothers. I don't like to call them Christians. And so that secret was the rage that ruled our home for 24 years. And in, uh, uh, that been 87, I guess? I'm not sure. Well, anyway, whenever it broke open, 89, I guess. 
1989 it broke open because other children from the orphanage went to the cops and uh, uh, laid charges against Mount Cashel Orphanage. They were all from the 1970s. My husband was there in the 60s with his three brothers. And so in a way, nobody knew that it had happened to him too. But he was so terrified that people would find out we could not watch television. We could not read a newspaper. We could not turn on the radio. Because in much the same way as Ford and Kavanaugh are on everything right now this week, this went on for six months. And our world was just totally torn apart. He admitted after a time that this was his secret. And we spent the next four years with him telling me in great detail everything that had happened. And believe me, that does not help. Wives shouldn't do that. He moved from beating me to trying to kill me because I knew the secret. In October of 1993, I reached the point of suicide. I just could not keep that evil within any longer. And we were living in Fort Smith, and if you ever a chance to uh, visit Fort Smith, it's quite the place. It's got a river with these incredible rapids right in the middle of the town. They're called the rapids of the drowned. Because if you step off a rock in this river, you will drown. There's no way you can live through it. And the incredible thing about it is pelicans nest in this river. And so you can go sit on the side and watch the pelicans fish. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And that morning, all I wanted to do was walk down to that river and step off a rock. I turned to my husband for help, and he said, go and do what you have to do. And that was the end of my marriage. Shortly afterwards, I was having coffee with a friend, and this is what she said. She described me as the strongest woman she'd ever met in her life. And she said, I swat you like a butterfly and kill you. But deep inside, your core is shining brightly, unbreaking, unbending. And it described exactly how I felt. I felt like I was floating away and there was nothing left of me. I left in, uh, what do you call it? Well, we won't go with that. I left and I went on a search to find something to help me. <coughs> Therapists, uh, abuse groups, and so on. And nothing ever helped until I came across a, this quote from William James. William James is a psychologist from the 1800s, the end of the 1800s, whose work has basically been ignored <coughs> because dear old Freud took center stage, right? And so not many people know about William James. But in the principles of psychology, he described a model of the self that he had developed. A man's self is the total of all that he can call his, not only his body and his psychic powers, but also his clothes, his home, his wife, his children, his ancestors and friends, his reputation and works, his lands, and horses, and yacht, and bank account. And when I saw this model, and read those words, and the rest that I'm going to be quoting later, I said, this is what happened to me. And I also said, this is what happened to my children, and my mother, and my friends, 
and everyone is that myself changed so dramatically that they, their selves, all had to change too. So we were living in chaos, all of us. Okay. Now this is the model of self as developed by William James in 1890. And this is the terms that he used at that time. The inside is the pure ego. This is the solid core that that woman could see sitting there drinking coffee from me. The solid core that never changes. The solid core that comes to us in conception and stays with us until death. Right? Around that we have the spiritual self, which is everything about you that can't be seen or measured in any specific way, and yet you know it's there. Beliefs, memories, emotions, reactions, and so on. Next to that is the social self. And the social self is a picture from every person who has ever heard for, about you or knows anything about you, their picture of you is in the social self. And suddenly we're all interconnected. Myself contains yourself. And that outside is the material self, and the material self is everything that can be measured. So, because of the fact that ego comes with Freud, and Freud is basically not being used anymore, I decided we needed to change the terms to match the world we live in. And so I changed them to spirit, mind, because of course I'd already used up spirit that he had for the mind, right? The social self and the material self. Now it doesn't really matter what words you use here. You can use your own words, that doesn't matter. It's the concept that's important. So the spirit of each human being is the center of one's individuality. It is a solid, unchanging force, which comes to us in conception and lives on after the death of the body. It has no shape, no size, no weight, and yet its presence or absence can be seen as one looks into the eyes of the living or dead person. I totally, I mean, I believe that it's also animals. It's not just people. And I think we're actually finding it out the same thing about plants now, but how many people had the opportunity of seeing the mouse die in the trap in the garage on Facebook? Did anyone get to see that? And the spirit goes up. You, you can see the spirit of the mouse leave because it's in the dark. It's in the dark, the trap claps. He's fighting for his life. So you can hear it and it's kind of enough light and then the spirit leaves. Amazing stuff, okay? The mind is our thinking self, the inner subjective being which contains all of our values and beliefs, all of our facilities and dispositions, all of our <coughs> abilities and talents, our moral sensibility, our conscience and our memories and our reactions. The mind is made up of that which cannot be isolated, seen, or measured in a concrete manner. The activity of the mind is revealed through one's behavior. Okay. The social self consists of the recognition of an individual receives from others. It is made up of all of the images of all of the individuals in the world who have ever had contact with one throughout one's life. This contact does not have to be personal, but can happen through friends, reputation, and the media. So, back in 1993, I didn't have a very big social self. Now I do. <laughs> now I'm known all over the world. And it's an amazing place to be. But think about somebody like Oprah or Hugh Grant, or the one that's in trouble right now. Think about how many people are in their 
in their circle? How about Kavanaugh and Ford right now? How many people are in their circle? And so it's unbelievable. So you can see how big the self is in the midst of being in this very simple picture. Now the outer, outer circle of the model of self represents the material self, which is made up of all we have that can be measured. So the material self is made up of all the stuff we have accumulated over time. Okay? It is made up of our bodies. Back. <laughs> as a whole and as an each part individually. And each of us have a unique body that we have to live in for our whole lives. And we can either accept them or reject them. Okay. Our food. Okay. Our homes. Our cars. Our clothes. You know what Adam's clothes look like, right? <laughs> and our roles. So in this picture, I have the roles of a wife, a daughter, a sister, a mother, a grandmother, an aunt, a sister-in-law, and a grand, great aunt. And I am playing all of those roles at the same time. Now, some are more important to me than others, but I am doing that, and I am juggling it, and it's working. You, too, are doing this all the time. Okay? Our jobs, and these are jobs whether we get paid for them or not. Okay? Our activities. What are the things that we do to keep, to have pleasure and keep our lives full? And there can be other things. They are also made up of all the things that we claim we own. Because we don't actually own all these things, but we have our own team. We have our grocery store. We have our club, our bank, our community, our university, our way of transportation if it's not in a car, and our country. And we own all of that too. And last of all, we own our planet, each and every one of us. And our planet is part of ourselves. Okay. All of these things give him the same emotions. If they wax and prosper, he feels triumphant. If they dwindle and die away, he feels cast down. Not necessarily in the same degree for each thing, but much in the same way for all. We're back with William James. Now, I also added another thing to the model to make it strong, stronger, and I call it the lifeline. And what the lifeline does is it connects your spirit to your material self and your social self and your material, uh, mater material self. Okay, your spirit to your mind, your social self, and your material self. It is a solid line. It is there all of your life. It never changes in much the same way that uh, your spirit never changes. However, we rarely live on our lifeline. We keep moving to the other things in our mind, our social self, and our material self. And so this is the compass, and it swings around to wherever you're putting your attention and your energy in the moment. Okay? You see how it moves? Okay? So now I want you to all draw a picture of yourself. I'm going to draw one up here, and I want you to draw a picture of yourself. Put the lifeline on, do not put the compass on.
Come on, I want you to do this. Practice with this. The reason I want you to, the reason I want you to practice with this is because it's this simple. You can draw this anywhere you are. You can draw it in a mat, on a napkin in a restaurant. You can draw it on any scrap of paper in your office. You can do, it's just very simple. You just, the circles, and then put the line in, okay? Now I want you to think about the material self, the social self, and the mind. And I want you to think of one thing that you live with right now that you know is 100% on your lifeline. It may be a person who treats you exactly as you are, who accepts you as the person you are, and treats you that way 100%. It may be a belief. I am honest. Adam has talked a lot during this week about I have integrity, right? That's what he's putting on his lifeline. This doesn't mean we always live there, but it's what is truly me, right? And so for me, I am going to put the skill on my lifeline. It's a material thing, but it is on my lifeline. I know I'm supposed to be working with this, right? Okay. Put something on your lifeline. You're, the only person that's going to see this is you. <laughs> I see another person who didn't draw herself. <laughs> we have to give her something she can't draw. Okay. Now I want you to look at yourself and think about someone or something or a belief that is the exact opposite of who treats you in the exact opposite of who you are as a person, the exact opposite of your lifeline. And in this case, that's my ex, right? He was a man in pain, but the man in pain made me live over here. So for 24 years, I was living over there. So is there anyone in your life who has done this? It could be in the past, it can be in the present. Someone who expects you to live off your line. My mother, kind of. She would be absolutely horrified to look at me right now. Bare feet in public, Gail. Bare feet on a stage, Gail. Didn't I raise you better than that? She's dead. So I won't have to listen to that now. But I can still hear her. Okay? But there can be other things, you know, anywhere in here that's going to pull you off your lifeline. So I just wanted you to have a bit of an experience of what it feels like to try and fill in a self, okay? Turn, uh, next one. So this is me in 2092, let's say. No, 92, 91. There I am. I'm, I'm missing a circle. You gotta go back one. Yeah, okay, there I am. I have a material self, right? I have a job, I have a home, I have four kids, I have lots of roles, and, uh, and I'm not totally happy, I'm not living on my lifeline by any means, but I have it all. And then, on February 19th, 1993, I had to walk away. There was a choice between life and death. If I hadn't left at that time, 
I would not be speaking to you today. Either he would have killed me or I would have killed myself. That's where I was. And so I lost my material self. Oh, now you can take it away. It was gone. I walked out of Madonna House with a backpack. Everything, everything was gone. My social self, they all knew Gail. They all knew who she was, right? Believe it or not, on my grandson's first birthday, we took a video. I was there. I know I was there. You do not see me in the video. You do not hear me. I was at my grandson's first birthday, my first grandson, that are much more special than the rest of them, though we wouldn't like to tell them that. <laughs> you did not see me. You did not hear me, because that was the gale everybody knew. That's how hidden I was in my world. So when I walked out, everybody's social picture went, Whoosh! what happened to her? And I lost my social self. I believed in marriage. When I stood in, by the altar in 1968 uh, and said, 50 years ago today, by the way, or not today, today, but this month, when I said, I do, I said it for life. I believed in marriage. I believed in monogamy. Monogamy, is that how you say it? Yeah. Very good. I believed in a mother and a father raising their children together. And the crazy thing was, because of the fear I lived in, I had always thought, I will leave when my kids go to university. And then Joshua was born. And it was much, much harder to break up grandma and grandpa than to break up mom and dad. Fascinating thing to learn. So all of my beliefs, I had to break them when I walked onto that plane. Okay? They're gone. And I got on a plane, and I flew to Edmonton, and I was a total and completely broken woman. Clay picked me up at the airport, and he can tell you how broken I was. Scared the hell out of him. And it took years for Gail to come back and rebuild all of that stuff. And so we have to be aware of this with our clients. We have to be aware of this with our friends. We have to be aware of this with everyone. We have people in Indonesia right now who are dealing with a tsunami that has wiped out everything. They're in the same state that I was. Not everyone loses it all at once. People in divorce lose a lot of it. People with the death of a child are just sent flying and so on. And so we have to be very gentle with people because of this. Now the other thing that happens with the self is the only thing that is solid is the spirit, right? So everything else is changing all of the time. Okay? Nothing is permanent except change. Okay? The self is not and never will be a solid unit which can be drawn, accepted, and understand, stood for all time. Only the spirit remains constant. The same from minute to minute, day to day, year after year. Everything else is formed over time and can be modified, discarded, lost, or rejected. The levels of the self, which encircle the core self of the spirit, are a fluid, moving, and ever-changing bundle which encircles the central core. Certain parts may appear to remain static for a time, 
But everything in the self except the spirit is constantly evolving. Adjusting to these changes in the self is an ongoing process throughout each of our lives. And this is what we are dealing with when we are in the room with our clients. We're dealing with this constant change that is happening to them. Change is never fine. They say it is, but it's not. And this is because change, all change, is uncomfortable. It takes energy. Nothing comes up more free, frequently in the skill than resistance to change. Right? Change leads to anxiety. The re direct result of a threat, which is change, of some kind or another to the levels of the self. The more levels of the self, self that are involved, the higher the level of anxiety. So for me, I was at the extreme by losing everything. For some people, it may be there's somebody here in West Vegas right now is losing their home to a fire. So they're losing material self, right? So that change is not going to be as big as mine is. But believe me, it's going to affect them. But understand that, that this change is, leads to anxiety. And if there's more levels of the self involved, the higher the level of anxiety. The closer the level involved is to the spirit, the higher the level of anxiety and the more extreme response. So in other words, it's pretty easy for us to change our job, to change a house, to buy a new car, and so on. However, and uh, Jeff was talking about this yesterday, to change our beliefs cause an incredible amount of anxiety. So if you're trying to get someone in your office to change their beliefs, believe me, you are going to get a lot of resistance. <laughs> okay? Change leads to discomfort. Discomfort leads to the buildup of stress. And this leads to the need to use coping skills to relieve the stress. And so we do that. And I figured that since Adam was introducing me, I'd put his coping skill on there. <laughs> Anybody have any idea what it might be? And mine, which is drinking coffee, of course. But you can see another one. Coping skill. That's how I got through 24, hours, 23, 24 years of abuse. So, Search of Self is a book that I wrote after 911 when the whole world was reeling. We could not believe that someone would use plane loads of passengers as bombs. And they did. We could not believe that humanity was that bad. I don't think we know what happened yet. And I'm not going to tell you, and I'm not going to guess. But I do know that many, many people lost their lives a day. And because of that, everyone was in turmoil. And so I realized, although it was working really good for me and working really good for my clients in my office, I had to write it for everybody. I didn't want to. I actually went and read every book I could on self-help to find the one that already talked about it so I didn't have to write the book. Because believe me, it's not an easy book to read, write. There are passages in this book that I would type five words, I would pace for an hour, and I would type five more words. Because pacing is a coping skill. Brings you down, right? And so it did get written. We published it first as an ebook because we were going to save paper. Everybody who got it and read it as an ebook said we need paper. And last week it arrived. So it's not only a good book for you in your office, it's also a good book 
for your clients who are struggling with change in one way or another. It uses two different tools. The first tool it uses is um, the model of self. And it goes through and tells you where we get our own unique self. Conception, the spirit arrives. And from then on, the self is built during gestation, during birth, during childhood, and so on. The layers get bigger and bigger as we grow. And the layers move and change. So that's what this book is about. $20 conference rate, $25 on Amazon. Please advertise it. Do you know that if you've sold 300 self-help books on Amazon, you're the top bookseller on that page? <laughs> I need 300 customers. <laughs> if, you write, if you buy it and like it and read it, please go on Amazon and leave reviews because I'm going to need them because I really think this is important. The other book I have out there, Just So Happy, is my journey to understanding autism. Started in 1988 when I was hired by a psychologist for a job I did not apply for. And to work with people I did not know existed. They are my people, 100%. They are my people. And uh, I'm not a doctor. I'm a family therapist. I'm not allowed to say most of the stuff I know. So it's written very carefully to say it in a way that I don't end up in court in Canada because that's not a nice place to be, is it, Debbie? <laughs> I have no intention of going there. And so it's written from my journey so that you can understand and learn what I learned without me getting sued. Our editor was terrible. It is not well edited, and I ask your forgiveness of that because we didn't realize it. When you write a book and you try to edit it yourself and check to see if you've done a good job, what ends up is you read what you thought. You don't read what's on the paper. And so forgive the editing. So now we're going to close this, but first we're going to do go on and solve this little problem that comes up on the scale all the time. Not all the time. It used to come up a lot more when I was writing my book. It actually was interesting. But the neat thing that happened here is that I kept put, turning on the scale and it was never coming up because I wanted this picture, right? And the other night we worked on Dylan and it came up. So I got a picture <laughs> to show you. So now we're going to go to the scale. I'm going to sit down. I hope you can see me and hear me. And we're going to show how I use the model of self and work towards self-awareness in the therapy room. Uh, go up and do the X up in the far corner. Yeah. And there we are. Oh, X that one out too. Okay. Start. No. Stay there. Yeah. Okay. Step one. To me, the most important line on, uh, on the scale is I take responsibility for myself. 100% I take responsibility for myself. And so for new clients, number one, I have to get them to fill that number in. And they say eight or whatever. And I say, okay, who's doing the rest of it? And I get lots of interesting answers. But the reality of it is, I make them move it to 10 because I tell them no. You're the only one that's responsible. And I'm only gonna work with you at a 10. And that means that I will not take any responsibility for you. I do not phone them and remind them that they have an appointment. I do not go out and beg them to come in. I don't do, when I hear the word that, 
oh, so-and-so has cancer, you better phone them and tell them you can work on them. No, that's not my job. I take responsibility for myself. I do not write notes and keep notes in my office. Why? Because why should I keep your journey in my life? Your journey isn't important to me, mine is. Your journey is important to you. Paper, pencil, write down whatever you want. If you want me to write it for you, I will write it during the session, but I'm not going to take over. Now, I'm also a family therapist. I'm not a doctor. So there's an awful lot of stuff in Canada I'm not allowed to do, and I walk the line carefully, especially after hearing what happened to Debbie. I am also not a nutritionist. I am not a dowser. I'm not a lot of things, so I don't do any of that either. I do skill and family therapy. And I leave my clients to find the rest of it themselves, to take responsibility for themselves. Okay, calibrate. The second thing that I do is, on that first vision visit, is talk about how does the skill come up with the information it has. And my first question is, have you heard we only use 10% of our brain? And everybody nods because that's a big fallacy out there that we only use 10% of our brain. And so then I go on and tell them that that is a fallacy. We are actually using 100% of our brain all of our time and that the conscious part, the verbal part, is what we are aware of. And so that is the 10%. But the rest is the superconscious. And it just keeps working all the time without us paying attention. It keeps us breathing. It keeps our heart beating. It keeps the blood flowing and so on. So we have no control over that, and yet it is help happening. The skill is t connecting to 100% of the brain, right? So when I say, you picked, because I tell them, you picked, when I push an unconscious choice, they know it's because we were talking to 100% of the brain, and the 100% of the brain knows everything. Now, I do have a lot of people who want the 100% of the brain to be psychic and know the future. I don't think it does that. And I think the fact that a lot of the people who don't trust the questions are asking those kind of questions. Okay, so we're going to test. I do have notes here telling me what I'm supposed to be talking about. Do you want me to do it with your hair in the test? Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, you could do it. Okay, on the test, there's a situation hold, right? So just turn that on. On the situation, oh, well, get rid of that again. On the situation hold, I ask my clients if they want something in there. They're the ones that get to choose it. They're the ones that get to use the name, our words. Why? Because of uh, the fact that I'm giving them the responsibility. Typically, I like the first session to always be a general session, just to see where it leads us. But if they come in and they want me to work on something specific, I will put it into situation hold. As we are testing, I go through the bar hop and I tell them everything that is here. Now, when I got this skill in 2005, Believe me, everybody was teaching, oh, don't show them the screen. You can't show them the screen because you know what? They're going to get scared. And as a family therapist, I'd already decided I wasn't going to live anybody else's journey. And I thought, well, how can I live? I mean, how can they learn anything if I don't show them the screen? We have always had them, had given them the freedom to look at the screen. I can guarantee you it takes about 15 minutes and they get bored because they don't understand it and there's so much information and so on, but the freedom to see it, and then I can point out things. I do things really quite quickly, and so I don't go into great detail on the bar hop, but I tell them if voltage is low, what do we got? 
79, you're stressed. It's probably affecting your adrenals. That's all I say if it's low. Uh, average is 76. Your brain isn't, you know, brain, and it might have something to do with the way you're thinking or your belief systems and so on. Resistance. There's a blockage in your body. It's not able to work as well as it should. Hydration is good. I've drank a lot of coffee when I was here. <laughs> I think coffee and water are the same thing. <laughs> you know? I don't think you take the water out of coffee when you're drinking it. And stay there, Clay. Oh, we didn't get the rest one. Oxygen. If you've got an oxygen that comes in at 39, what's your first thought? Smoker. I got a smoker. <laughs> and I ask. A lot of times they're not. A lot of times they are raised in smoking homes, right? And to be honest, I was. 18 years at home with my father smoking. 24 years in a marriage with a smoker. And tobacco still comes up as one of my major things and 13 years of detox, but it kind of stays there. So anyway, I go through that whole thing. I look at the purple up here, and that's where I concentrate my thing, and we've got energy, what's this? Energy management, energy management. That, I see that as an emotional thing, and hyperreactivity. Hyper is uh, I also see that. Well, that's everything. It could be allergies. I tell you, I got allergies. And double click on the situation hold. Now, I would do that after I typed the word, if I typed one in, but he was going already. So double click on this. And here. The situation hold. OK, yeah. Oh, it didn't come up. Most of the time, it comes up with a clue there. And that's where I got the self-awareness from Dylan. And I find that if you do what's there, you have great sessions. Okay? Now, the next thing I do when the report comes up is go to the top of it. And I look at these numbers. Environmental, physical, mental, social, and spiritual. Now, this works for me. Is it how the inventor... Planned? I don't know, because he's never told me. But it works for me, and so this is how I measure it. If it's over 100, I go for the highest. If it's under, I go for the lowest, right? And I talk to them. I call this the focus of the session, and I talk to them about how this is an area of concern that they need to look at. So my numbers are 61 for environmental, 75 for physical, 76 for mental, 70 for social, and 72 for spiritual. Typically for environmental, I think about toxins. How many of you have been to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada? A couple of you, okay. We're oil country. We're big oil country. We got lots of money because of that. <laughs> But on the east side of Edmonton, there is a road called Refinery Row. And it has all of the refineries and all of the plastic com companies along Refinery Row. Now, more of them are moving out of town. And actually, if you go farther east, you're going to find even bigger ones now. But Refinery Row is situated on the east side of Edmonton, and right next to Refinery Road, no, yeah, on the west side of their town is a place called Sherwood Park. And Sherwood Park is huge and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I can guarantee that if a client comes in from Sherwood Park, it's going to come up environment, because these people are poisoning themselves living there and choosing to do that, right? Environment, toxins, allergies, stress. In the autism world, I can clear autism from the body. And what autism is, is a blockage to communication and social interaction. Now, there's a lot of other stuff when you're going to learn if you buy the book. But the 
actual autism is that blockage. And I can clear it. But if the environment doesn't change, we have a problem. If they are still sitting in a classroom and they're, where they're treated as they're retarded, we have a problem because now they can tell us, and they do. If they're in a group home where they're being treated like shit, I tell you, they will become a problem, and they have, to the point that parents don't want to come to me anymore because they like it the way it was as we throw all of these people in the garbage. The smartest, brightest, most intelligent people in the world are being thrown in the garbage because we're not willing to open the door and accept them as they really are. It's a very sad place to be. I've cried many, many tears over it. Physical. Uh just to clarify, when Gail says she clears the autism, she doesn't cure autism. No, she take takes away the blockages, which gives them uh, a chance, let's say, to verbalize their thoughts. It just changes their lives for them. But autism is not cured with our program. No, we can't cure it. can't cure anything. But no, I, I talk blockages. Something's blocking you, and, and I clear it. I have this need to tell you the first little boy that we did the protocol on, eight years old, uh, sitting in the chair. One word, he could talk, he spoke one word. He never initiated speech, but if I said, say hello, yeah. hello, right, those kind of things. He had never asked a question, he had never spoken in a full sentence, he had never used anyone's name in all of the time, and he was eight years old. He was watching a movie about the ocean because that was his obsession at the time. We, I totally recognize their intelligence and so we keep our, our office, at, we don't do the office anymore, so, but our office was set up to keep that brain busy. And so you know, they could bring their own videos or we had ours and such and they had a television screen. So he's sitting watching the uh, movie with the ocean and I'm finishing up the protocol and his mother goes to the bathroom and I'm working with my back to the television and I hear a voice Gail Gail turn it on turn around quick quick Gail turn around and I s look at him and he's pointing at the television look Gail so I turn around and the walruses were farting Typical eight-year-old humor, and he was free to do it. And he went to school that day, and instead of pointing at pictures, he was giving his teachers the answers. It works if you take out the blockages. Okay, physical. Now on physical, I want you to go up to system power center settings. Now on the Mandalay program, We've lost all the color. How many people had their things back in the day when we had color on that screen? Not too many of you? I loved the color. And then it disappeared. And I said to Mandalay, you gotta put the color back. So if you go up to system power settings and drop it to the very bottom, you're gonna get the colors back. Okay, get it? See? And you've got to kind of know what these things mean. I mean, red is bacteria, green is fungus, and so on. But to me, the important one is the yellow one. The yellow ones point out all the organs that are stressed, and they want the liquescence for, the, for those organs. And so if I'm working physical, that's the first thing I'm going to do is click on the grid to see what's coming up in yellow. And what we have here is environmental pollutants. Guess where I've been? On a plane. In a room that's blasting me with an air conditioner. And, and industrial pollutants. This is not a nice place. <laughs> and my throat is beginning to feel it. But 
You will see lymph, you will see liver, you will see, if you do this with your clients, you're going to know which organs. I also, of course, look at the, the reds and so on, but I'm more interested in those yellows because they're the healing ones for the organs. Then I go to, this is physical, uh, research and library. And I click on Nelson Report, and I learn a lot from Nelson Report. Now, first of all, there's the emotion. This would be, if mental came up, we'd be worried about the emotion, right? And so the emotion this time, motivation? Yeah. I don't know what my motivation, my motivation today is selling books. Okay? Make it work. <laughs> now why, why it came up motivation for me, I don't know. But I will talk to my client about that one. Why is that coming up if it's a mental on the other page? I will also read aloud the affirmations. My hormones work perfectly. My body's natural detoxing mechanisms are functioning perfectly. And you can see now how we tie this together. What came up in yellow? Toxins. What came up here? Toxins. So I cut and paste that. Or I cut first. By the way, this is my wonderful husband, Clay, who is also <laughs> No, don't close it. No. Okay, now go to EPR and drop it down to uh, organ generators and paste their in affirmation in the white line. This is what I do if they want to put another affirmation in themselves. I give them the choice. And they have to write it themselves. I don't make it for you. I've gone through an awful lot of uh, uh, workshops where people have given me long, long affirmations to paste in here. But I believe in pasting what's unique to this individual. I also ask them, what, what, does the, what do these two mean to them? Because this is what's coming up for you. One of the first times we were on the skill, uh, Clay's daughter, was told when she was a very little girl that she had heart problems, that there was something wrong with her heart when she was born, and she was reminded by, of this by the family all throughout her life. Her very first affirmation was, my heart works perfectly. It matches the individual. So I paste it, and then you uh, I hit spiritual harmony, activate the organ field. I do not change any numbers because uh, I find it works perfectly good without me playing with it. And, and it runs for the rest of the session, right? Okay, time to uh, close. Mm. Got this close to it. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing I do is I look at the organs. And the organs that have come up here are lungs, parathyroid, sinus, and thyroid. And considering the fact Oh, you got to get all of them. You're, oh, you're putting the things in. Now, if you're going to do this, you have to know you've got to put a space between the organs if you're going to use them. So considering the fact that my throat is all clogged up, you know, it makes sense to me, but I talk to them about the organs that have come up because often these organs are not the ones they expect, right? However, I say I follow the lead of the skill, so we're going to work on these in a special way, and we'll get to what you want to work on before the session is over. Cut it. Clothes, programs, universal, and paste it in the organ section of Hollow Linguistic. Go down and work on multimedia to protect him, right? Because he's running the running the program. Close. Now the next one I go to is the risks. And drop to the bottom and we look at what is the top risks, what are the chronic risks, and we talk about them. Because it's not often what they, what they uh, expect, but at the same time, it, uh, uh, the, what 
what the brain is telling us is this might be the core to what your problem is. So right now mine is uh, sensory, click on it, du uh, food poisoning. Oh, you're not double, oh, double click. click will it go up until, uh, yeah, it will without done. Those, those, they're going to take all those silly gray panels from this one, don't they? Drives me crazy, all those. Okay, again, you have to put the uh, double space between. And then the uh, chronic one is the lymph, okay? And I will cut these. And at this point, I'm just talking to the client, seeing what's going on, and uh, not really, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm telling them everything that's coming up, but I'm not really working on it. What I'm telling them, I'm setting things up in the background to make your session more powerful. Close, programs, universal, and pasted in the hololinguistic in the first yellow box. Close. And we go to NLP. Mental factors and emotion chart. Uh, down there. Okay, value of emotions, value of neurotransmit, and then I double click on anything over 100 that's in this first line. If there's nothing over 100, I will go down to the bottom and find out the chronic ones. I tell my clients this is in the moment. This is what uh, emotions you are, are hyper uh, are high right now. And when we, get, we look at the chronic, I tell them these are the ones that you've carried since childhood. And that's the ones they really resonate with, the ones they've carried from childhood. Um, we're going to cut and paste. I've also hit value of narrow transmitters, right? And as you can see with the numbers, no, you haven't hit it yet because, yes, oh, it order. is 185. As you can see, the numbers are in order, the values, so you know you've hit it, okay? Close. Close. Close programs. Run it down to, uh, and then paste it in there. Okay, and then we click Add to Schumann Wave. Mm -hmm. Now, the scale has told us all of this information, and we've already got it running in the background for the rest of the session. It takes about five minutes to do this while you're talking to your client. And in the beginning, I didn't know how to do this, and I can tell you I was freaking out because there's so much coming up on the skill that I want to do. Well, at least here I'm listening to the skill and I'm doing it. It's in the background. I tell them that's what it's working on. Everything that came up for you right now, and we leave this and it'll run through the rest of the program. Close? Yeah. If you copy and paste, there's actually four spaces between each one. Oh, you don't put spaces between these. The emotions you don't have to, but everything else you do. There's only one space between the organs because they were never meant to do this. No, she's saying there's four. There's more than two, but then the rest of them. Like at Sandra's I'm not sure, but I think that if you if the skew goes to the second or third space, let's say nothing there, right. it would continue on and after that, there's something there again after two more spaces. You're saying there's three between, uh, no, between the emotions? There's four. four. Oh. Yeah, so I've never found any problem with not reducing it to two. But if you worry about it, it's just a matter of taking your... and taking. You might want to do it. I've never seen spaces. that before, so thank you. You always learn something here. Yeah, so... <laughs> we all teach it, each other all the time. Yeah. At times I take out the two and the other times I don't and... It seems to work both ways. Okay. So we've got lot, not much time, so let's close. <laughs> okay. Close. Now we're back on the matrix. We're closing. Close. I'm on the matrix. I know. Close. Oh, you want me to close? It? Close it. <laughs> okay. Oh, we're going to Neo. Shaping function. Mm. Yeah. Okay, now if you look at shaping function, what you will see is at the bottom of the list, you already have the uh, neurotransmitters all lined up from the bottom to the top 
in, in order. So you're going to see the uh, neurotransmitters that are uh, most needed. And so if you start at the bottom, you start writing those numbers in and double space between your numbers uh, and use these as a reward during the program. Uh, I've been told a lot of different things and there is no real rules for anything we do on the scale. What we do works, what we feel like working with seems to work. There's no, oh, it's not going to work if you do it, but you're doing it all wrong. There's none of that. Now, I do five. Uh, when I talked to Desi about this, she said, only one. But why only one? I mean, it's a reward. It's like saying, I can't give you five different things for dinner. You know, that's what I think. So I do the five. And always disengage because it is connected to only love when you put them in. So if you disengage, then engage. Now it's going to be all six of them. Right? Then if you hit reward, you're telling the body what's coming. Every time you do a uh, treatment that is, reaches uh, 85 or above, because that's the number we have up there is 85, every time you do that, you are going to get the word excellent if your computer is turned on, and, or uh, sound, and that excellent will give you a boost of all those neurotransmitters. So it makes the body want to work with you because it's being rewarded. Now the excellent is a very neat thing because it's like the whistle in Pavlov's dog, right? So for the next 72 hours, every time you hear the word excellent, you will get a boost of these neurotransmitters, even when you're no longer hooked up to the skill. I find it a very interesting word because it's not one we use a lot, right? So you hire people to say it to you or you say it to yourself. Just keep that excellent flowing. We worked with a little girl in uh, Switzerland on, uh, with autism and, and so uh, uh, her parents were saying excellent to her when she wasn't on the skill too because she didn't speak English but it was coming in. So. So anyway, in the mornings, she knew when she was going to have her sessions, and she'd get up and she'd run into the kitchen and she'd say, excellent. <laughs> okay, so that's running now. Uh, back to test. Okay, now I've got to start looking at my things. So. Um, okay, the next thing I want to do is turn on the body viewer. It's down there at Skeel, remember? Body viewer. Oh, down. Body viewer. The far end. <laughs> Way down. Way down. Oh, here. Oh, no. no. Way down here. System. No, it's gone. Is it on the Quest now? Yeah. I think it's on the Quest. No, Quest. Quest, Quest, Quest. Top right. Right here. There. Hey, somebody got the red thing. Oh, there it is. Ah, we couldn't find it. Somebody stole the, somebody stole the one we were using yesterday. <laughs> this one's yours, I know you. Or chase me down or do something. Okay, I think we got this now. Okay, now here, I don't know how many you know, because I've just been told nobody taught me that, is you have to drop down to this, on the program start, now I gotta learn how to, and then drop down to the second line to turn this on. If you, the second line, not the first line, the second line. And that will do this, and that connects it with everything. So, uh, some of you may have been slightly misled for turning on, but, uh, so now we're gonna go to skiotherapy and aura cleanse and we see the aura and I got a black cloud what does a black cloud mean negative energy can be anything and I'm walking here thinking about 
what Alec was teaching yesterday, and he said, protect yourself, because I cleared, this week I cleared negative energy from someone, so it could mean that. So if you've got a black cloud, it will tell you there's a spiritual problem, probably. Now, the other part of it is pretty nice, but the colors of the aura will go with the colors of the chakras. So you will see, basically, here we've got all of them. This is a beautiful aura, except for that black cloud. And uh, so you will see uh, the areas, again, for the organs and so on, that you're going to be wanting to work on just by looking at the aura this early in the thing. Leave, body viewer. Oh, there's red clouds, there's turquoise. What? That one? I look at the color. Uh, that one? Just the black cloud because the rest of the colors are so good. That one is a beautiful one. But if it's all red, base. If it's all green, heart. If it's all red, yellow. If it's dark blue, throat, you know. Look at your chakras. Look at your colors. Turquoise clouds. Turquoise clouds sticking to the body. You find this often in autism. Means you have come to earth with a message for the world and you're hanging on to it. So you see the turquoise clouds. You ask the person, you know, do you really feel like you're doing what you're meant to do here? Because that's what it's telling us. That you're hanging on to it. If it's turquoise and it's spread out, you are spreading the message that you're supposed to be. Cloud tight, you know, it's tight to you, then you're holding on to it. If it's spread out, then I do have an aura teacher who's wonderful. <laughs> okay, we're back here. So now, because of the fact we saw a black cloud, and this is what I would do with spiritual. Okay? I oh, he's five minutes? Yeah. <laughs> I hate you. Andrew, please. No, I knew I knew this would happen. I knew this would happen. Anyway, okay. I'm not gonna do spiritual. Anybody wants spiritual or any of those, I've got this all written up. So you just contact me. By the way, I'm on Facebook. I have lots of friends. I even have some very interesting followers, and I don't complain about them. And I don't know why they want to see what I'm doing every day, but so be it. That's what I'm saying. Contact me. The best place to contact me, Facebook. I will say I will be a friend to anyone who's involved with skill or autism. I originally did not plan to do that, but... But then you can chat with me, and I can send you protocols, okay? Because obviously this isn't working. I want to go to uh, NLP. Brain scan. Now I'm going to show you what uh, I do with the riddles, okay? And, uh, yeah. And then we get the cancer program going. I'm not really using this very effectively, am I? Uh, did you click on it? Yeah. Okay. It's going to come up. It might. It's down here. See right there. This one. No, next one. This one here. Yeah. Oh yeah. There it is. Okay. So this is what comes up. Hit the cancer scan. And you're going to get a message, which is a riddle. So uh, cut, uh, copy it. It lies in my stomach, unable to digest the morsel, dispute with family members, often co concerning inheritance or in, I don't know what that word is. Or in corp corporations when one cannot give one's oh, oh, oh co corporations. It's, it's missing its space. In corporations where one cannot get one's share, meaning that one cannot completely digest it 
or sometime not receiving entitled rental payments or legal benefits. So in other words, I am not getting, this is Mead translating this riddle, I don't feel like I'm getting my share. Right? That's what I'm reading from it right now. Copy it. Yeah. Okay, now hit uh, additional. Now you're going to see some more. And we've got a spiritual concern. Uh, there's nothing there. Then we have teachers. Deep unconscious hurt. I'm being infected by the teachers. I'm standing here with like two minutes left. <laughs> I had four hours when I signed to come. And the other teachers took it away. <laughs> now, I don't mind that, but I'm probably uncon unconsciously I think I do. Well, I am. <laughs> but no. The fact that so many signed up to speak for Mandalay just thrills me to the core because we have to save the industry and I think this is the way we're doing it. Okay, we're, I gotta do this part. It's almost done. Okay, so we're going to go, uh, uh, close. Right, close, close, okay, close, okay, close. Uh, mental factors and emotion chart. Uh, mental factors and, emotion chart. and see this white line? Yeah. I paste the riddle there. Okay, so the riddle is pasted there. And then go to uh, unconscious reactivity right down here. Uh, Above emotion chart. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, age 68. Start. Okay. Just run it and we'll see what comes up. Because I got something nice to talk about this in the meantime. How many watched the news this morning? You hit reset? Oh, did I lose it? Sorry. I hope not. Well, I hope that something comes up. I don't know. But you're supposed to hit start and it'll tell you where this originated in your life. Okay. This morning, how many watched the news? I can't, I can't remember her name. Monica. Monica Lewinsky is on, and she's got a special, special day for anti-bullying. And she wants us all to change our name on social, all social media to the bully names that we were called as children. Isn't that a powerful thought? Except my bully name wasn't very nice. And I think that might have something to do with this. Because I've been thinking about, do I dare do it? My name when I was born was Pearson. My bully name was Pure Shit. So I don't know if I'm brave enough. <laughs> Gail, Gail. But, okay, so he did. So we've got something that happened at age 32, age 58, age 52, age 64. And it ties in with my father, which is interesting. Uh, he died when I was 52, maybe. No, 58. Dad? No, it would be 52, yeah. 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 And it's stored in my muscles and my hormones. Now, somebody was teaching you how to fix this all, right? But if you do it this way, you tag directly into the cause of the cancer. Now, I was taught less is more. There's no way I'd be throwing four or five of these screens up at a time personally, right? Because I take that one and it is so powerful in releasing cancer. If you get that little red line on the DGEN panel behind Universal and it says emotional lesion, not something, uh, this will take it out. Now talk to the person. Talk to your person about it. How much time? Can I sneak a couple more minutes? Can I sneak a couple more minutes? <laughs> when I first got the skill, I had a pain in my stomach. 
And when I went on the scale, I said, it said cancer every time I went on in the small intestine. Now, it took me quite a while to decide to actually do something about it because I was working. I actually had one week of training and was working solidly with autistic children for months uh, right away because they all knew, you know, they all were my clients already. So. so anyway, I wasn't very important. But I finally thought, you know, I need to deal with this. And so I went on and I did this and put the riddle in, riddle in there. And it was something like the starving to death. And it came up again with my father, which is interesting. And, oh, it is interesting. <laughs> anyway, uh, see all the insights you get while you're doing this? <laughs> he, um, so I went on there, and what you do with your client is you ask yes, no questions. Okay, the client says, like me, I said, my father and I never had a conflict. Never. My mother and I? Oh, yeah. My father? No. My father was an incredible man. He treated every person in the world the same, no matter who they were, no matter what they did. And we were taught as children to go into the nearby city. And not teach it because he taught us. He t taught us because this is what he did. And he would talk to the homeless people on the street in exactly the same way he would talk to the pastor at church. You know, he was just incredible that way. So, of course, I have no problems with my father, who happens to be dead when this was going on. And so I started arguing with Skeel. It was age 17. Are you sure it wasn't age 18? When I met my ex. Must have been age 18. Nope. Isn't it got to do with Randy, my ex? Nope. And so I said, I've got to. I've got to listen to the skill. And I thought about age 17. In age 17, I graduated from high school. I started school in grade uh, five, and so I graduated at 17. I wanted to become an interior decorator, and the only interior decoration school in Alberta at the time, you had to be 18 to get in. So I solved the problem in my mind by saying, I will get a job and work for a year, and then I will go and become an interior decorator. Except there were no jobs. I went to the city, and I applied and applied and applied. But if you didn't have any experience, there were no jobs. And so in my family, my mother had uh, three sisters and a sister-in-law. And the five of them would get together, and they would talk, and things would happen. So in my conscious brain, I fully believed my aunts and my mother all got together and decided I didn't, shouldn't use, waste the year. And I found myself enrolled in the local college, taking the first year of education. And so I typed in. Was this about giving up interior decorating? Yes. And the tears started to flow. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried. And the cancer was gone. Completely and totally gone. My dad was dead. I couldn't ask him. But my mother was still there. And so I said, Mom, who decided I should go to college. And, I, and she said, your dad. He believed that there were only two jobs for women, teaching and nursing. And if you didn't want to be a nurse, you had to be a teacher. I can guarantee you I did not know that 
in my conscious mind. But my unconscious knew. And I carried that loss for years. Could figure it out, probably. 2005, uh, 17, 17 minus 2, well, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> it, uh, I carried that pain, and it developed into stomach, uh, uh, small intestine cancer. Now, the neat thing about this, which I'm going to quit now because Cassandra's here, and he is sweet, isn't he? <laughs> He's, he by the way, he is my favorite. <laughs> and I'm embarrassing him now at that. I don't know why, but he just feels so good to be around. And anyway, I was uh, teaching in Ireland. I did the autism protocol there, and I told the story. Uh, and one of my students said, but you are an interior decorator. <laughs> the interior is just a different interior than the one you thought about back then. <laughs> Isn't that neat? <laughs> so you works. I'll be here. I'm on Facebook. You want to be my friend? You can. Oh, can I say something about the picture? Okay. Someone said the first night we were here at the... But you don't look like your picture. <laughs> If you want to know what happened with my picture and you're a Facebook friend, go to notes on my page and read the story, A Door Opens, or Closes, A Door Closes. It's a, in 2011, so you have to scroll down a ways. But it tells you the story of how that picture got taken. And the reason I don't look like my picture is because I'm highly allergic to almost anything. And after putting any makeup on, hairspray, all of that, I suffer for a week afterwards. So right to get here. the picture that he had up there right of right me means I had to be in trouble. Okay? Unconscious. Okay. Huh? Oh, I thought that you were waiting for me to be done. No. I'm just Oh, because I'm your favorite, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Oh, I'm done, I think. Because yeah. the five minutes went by a long time ago. Okay. okay. You now, yeah, you can steal a little bit. We can steal that. more. Do you want to keep on going? Yes. Okay, so you've learned that one. I want you to teach you now. If you have a problem and you don't know what to do, uh, I'm going to teach you a couple of things that will let you know how to figure it out. Uh, matrix. Not right now. Okay, but you gotta find an old program. They're all on the side. <laughs> and truthfully, can I do that? No. Desi turned all my old programs. We'll find an old program and figure it out. Okay, those colors came on the original program. And they were all printed on the side instead of that white thing. They, you know, you could see all the colors so you knew what they are, but all of them have been updated. So I don't even know if I can find them. So if you go to uh, EPR and to patient subconscious and you don't know what to do, if you click on this one, okay, you just come, you just come in. Yeah. And it says list diseases. You can put in whatever your client wants to put in there. So right now, let's put toxins in for me because the whole program is showing toxins. Could be industrial and environmental too. Right? You want me to put them yeah, why don't you do that? We taught in Istanbul while he's doing this. We taught in Istanbul and we had this hotel room and we arrived in the midst of a blizzard. You come all the way from Canada to Turkey and you have the first blizzard they've had in 10 years. People in Turkey don't know what to do with that. So our hotel was like a sauna. So I solved the problem by opening my window, which I do in Canada all the time, because I don't live on the east side of Edmonton. And off in the distance, you see this yellow haze. That's how polluted it is. My brain wasn't smart enough to figure out if it's yellow over there, it's yellow here, and it's coming in. I got so sick from that one. <laughs> okay, 
So once you've typed it in, start the superconscious link, it's going to give you treatments for that problem. Uh, ooh. It'll just take a minute. Well, yeah. Typically, you can see the whole purple screen, but I can't right now. That you can actually be reading these well, while still. you're doing it. But you can read them all, and you're going to get clues as to what you can work on here. There's a treat all button. So we're going to treat it. So you're going to give them all the clue, uh, I mean, all the treatments that you want for this. Now, I use this a lot when someone has parasites or bacteria or something, because it's really kind of neat as to what comes up later, OK? So I, it's all in red. I can't read on there, read that. But it says I'm autistic. That's wonderful. No, by the way, autistic on here and autistic on here, two different things. Okay, this is a syndrome. This is a named uh, syndrome from the me mental health community, right? Autistic on there is the original meaning of autistic, which means kind of withdrawing into yourself. That emotional tendency to, so if you see autistic coming up, you're not autistic. You have a, probably a slightly inverted and you like to draw into yourself. You're not the outgoing party person. That's all it's telling you. You need quiet time, yeah? Your sense of that kind of thing. It's not a problem, but to understand they're two different things. If you want to know how to see autism first on the scale, first session, resonance frequency is probably between 25,000 and 30,000. So it's a pretty good. And believe me, it comes up for a lot more people than are diagnosed. Between 25,000 and 35, uh, 30,000. It's not the million dollar one. Okay, close. Now, as you close this, look what happens. The yellow lines went over here, right? So now you can work on them and you learn more. But even more so, you have a go to them. So if you make sure you're on return to Maine, always write down this number because if you're not on return to Maine, you disappear. Oops, sorry, thank you, sir. <laughs> Make sure you're on return to main, because it will disappear if you click on go to. If you haven't written it down, you might lose it. But it will give you a clue. And the clue is delusion. delusion. OK. So it's an emotional clue for me, right? In other words, words I'm probably hanging on to the toxins because of my mental way of thinking. And so then you can work on those kind of things too. Now, you're still at the end of your rope. You don't know what's going on. Go to uh, color charts. And solutions. Solutions? Yeah. Way down. Way down to solutions. Oh, uh, on the programs. Yeah, no, no. Down the down the line. Way down, way, way down. Here. Solutions. Like uh, can't see very information oh, load co color charts. There it is. Okay. Now you have this wonderful little thing that you can fill out with your client. Use their words because their words are far more powerful, no matter what they are than your words are. You all know how to get to the color. Uh, no. Okay. Information. Okay, yeah. So I'll just close this one out, so. Are talking about chart maker? Yeah. What? Yeah, load chart, uh, chart maker. But anyways. Yeah. If, you, if, you write the, well, for, if you write down the first word, the everything's list. alphabetical. So information is a column. Load color charts is L. Right? There's so load there. will give you the word. And then this comes up, and you go across to solutions. Okay. 
Information, load color, make, uh, chart maker color reports? Yeah. Okay. And then solutions is over here. So if you use their words, you are going to get some in incredible information from them. Now, I don't know what's going to happen because I've never done this without filling it out, but we don't want to waste time. So once you've filled it out, click on continue. And you're going to get a whole load of uh, uh, suggestions in here on how to work with this client. And believe me, they may, may make absolutely no sense at all to you. I had a client that come in. She had been in the mountains for the weekend, and her feet were so swollen that she was wearing the largest pair of men's slippers she could find because that's all she could get her feet into. She had gone to the hospital. They had told her, we haven't got a clue, but we can give you some medication. Uh, so, and she said, what kind of medication? And they said, you choose. And she looked at him and said, you don't know what it is, and you're going to give me a medication, and I get to choose it? This doesn't make any sense. So she came to me. I did everything on here, and she walked out with normal feet. I haven't got a clue what I did, because it says wow. hyperactivity on biofeedback, eight minutes. We did it, sort of idea. And that's how strong this is. If you follow the instructions that make absolutely no sense to you, it works. Okay? Okay, go back. Uh, the solution would be to take those things or to... Well, you see, the thing is all those yellow and red lines, because I didn't fill in all the information, they, they will be full of answers. And then you do a calculate over there, right? Oh, and there's a whole bunch of them. So I have... Oh, I have to sap my sexually transmitted diseases on auto bar hop. And I have a cancer virus is discovered. So, and the, the reality of the cancer virus is if you're my age, you actually had it injected in your body with the polio vaccine back in the 50s and 60s. That's known, that's fact. The person that discovered that had her life destroyed because the uh, vaccine industry did not want anyone to know. And millions and millions of children my age and the kids I went to school with are dying of cancer because they were injected with it. So anyway, but it'll come and go because guess what? It's out there in the world. And it tells you, see, test scream for 13 minutes and time therapies for 19, you see, it gives you the actual time. It also gives you a whole bunch of things that the person can do. Now, if you do super conscious search for therapy, it gives you more things. Isn't this wonderful? <laughs> and, uh, okay, now we're going to close that, and we're going to close again. Uh, no, let's see, return to questions. Where does it say that? Right here. Return to questions. If you're back on this page, and you're still totally and completely lost, you can talk unconscious to the patient, right? Now, you can ask yes-no questions here in the same way that you do on NLP, but you can also talk to the unconscious, so press that. Okay, I have to stop being so judgmental. See, understand it? Okay, continue. Now, this is not clear discussion. We're talking to an unconscious. Uh, continue unconscious is right down there in the middle. Okay, life heals itself if, if you stop interfering. Your verbal self deceives you every day. Listen to your heart. Could be stop, judgmental. Your father. I find it fascinating. My father's coming up today so much. <laughs> do, do not trust and sadness, at sadness. Uh -huh. uh, but do, oh, could be the father of my children? It could be, but maybe no, not. I, I, uh, oh, I want to tell you about Neil and Adam. We're sitting at lunch, and Adam is, you know Adam, how he spouts off every once in a while. 
And then Neil asks him a question about digestion, and Adam is about to answer. And Neil starts talking about all of the parts of digestion using the medical terms. And Adam's sitting there. My perfect picture of Adam. <laughs> I didn't have a camera. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. But anyway, this can go on, and you can get some good things. We had a woman come in for... Uh, Alzheimer's and she was getting worse and worse and when we asked the SNL questions about her it wasn't coming up with Alzheimer's and you have to understand this about memory loss and old age and so at some point we went on here and we did this a number of times and it kept coming up with her brothers and lust lust is a big clue for you by the way it's an important word to pay attention to on the scale and so we asked her were you sexually abused by your brothers? And she said yes. And that she actually fled Italy because of this and cut herself from her family. She didn't have Alzheimer's. She didn't want to remember. So every time we were forcing her to remember, every time we were treating her memory, we were making it worse. So be aware of that. And lust, if lust is coming up, you're probably going to be dealing with sexual assault or sexual abuse. Not always, though. No. Just, 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 just as a variable. Like, let, let me just say, my wife got pregnant when we were, like, four months in on a relationship, like the newness time, where you're like, oh, my God. Right? You can't keep your hands off of each other. And then because it was so early, we were just kind of going to pound town for, like, the next eight months. Did I just say pound town? I did. Yeah. Whoops. Point is, anyway lust showed up on my son for like the first eight months of his life uh -huh. and it was the energetic experience of utero being, being abused in the womb yeah <laughs> <laughs> well put it this way i wasn't as active with my second child and i felt guilty for a good couple of years after that so yes i guess there was some abuse going on i imagine their perspective is kind of precarious well, isn't that interesting, though, because, you know, the guest station, isn't it wonderful what we learn about guest station on this thing? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'd never thought that thought before right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, okay. So, so anyway, that's, we're going to close now because I think we've used up our 10 minutes. I've got tons and tons more, but come to Budapest. I'm going to talk again, but you'll probably hear the same stuff all over again. <laughs> And expect all of us, all of the instructors in North America, uh, to become a lot more active over the years to come as we will be rebuilding the community through the likes of education, which is how community was built to begin with. But no, it's going to have to go bigger than that because this is Gail Gillingham Wiley. Is there a Lairdess? Oh, so again, a huge round of applause for Lady Gail Gillingham Wiley. And for one of the most amazing support systems and examples of what it is to be in a beautifully balanced marriage. Granted, we don't see behind the curtains, but I can say this. Every time I've seen the energetic between these two, it's always inspiring. And it's always beautiful to see two people that support each other in the way that they do. Thank you so much.